Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Department of History and Seminar Series. For the one or two of you who might not know, my name is Stephen Maynard. I teach in the field of the history of sexuality, which is just one of the reasons why it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Nick Seraf. Nick has ventured to us all the way from the University of Kansas, uh, where he is Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexual Studies, history, as well as being an associate dean of arts and sciences. Uh, I should say right from the start that I am meeting Nick, at least in person, for the first time right now. So I don't get to share with you any amusing or mildly embarrassing anecdotes. <laughs> okay. What I can tell you, however, uh, is that Nick is a major force uh, in our field. Nick serves on the editorial committee of the Journal of Gender and History, and he is with our colleague, Dr. Shida Pundit, the uh, co-editor of the Journal of the History of Sexuality. In addition to serving as the co or the president of the Society of History of Children and Youth, Youth and Children, um, Nick is also a longtime member of the Committee on LGBT History uh, in the US and uh, a chair of its almost annual conference including one that's coming up this spring in uh, Cal State Fullerton. It is also a prolific contributor to an editor of special issues and collections, uh, including two current projects. One of them is the Cambridge History of Sexuality in the United States, and uh, the other is Queer American History, a reader in documents and essays. And somehow in the midst of all that activity, Nick has also published four books. His first two books, one on white college fraternities and the other on child marriage, demonstrate, I think, Nick's determination to view sexuality not in isolation, but always in relationship to other historical variables, um, such as masculinity and age. His third book, An Open Secret, was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2021, and it looks at the intergenerational relationship uh, between Robert and John Gray out in early 20th century Chicago. The white, well-heeled Allertons uh, also owned substantial property, bought substantial property in Hawaii. And this um, allows Nick to, I think in a really original, <clears throat> crucial way, to link queer history to questions of property, of colonialism, um, and indigenous dispossession. And that, I think, is also a really important reminder for us here this morning of having our conversation about the history of sexuality to um, remind ourselves that we will be doing so on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, uh, including, importantly, their two-spirit and other gender-diverse kin. A final characteristic of Nick's um, historical work, I think, is his commitment to making the sexual past speak to the present. And I think we see that most clearly in the work he's doing right now with um, the, his new book, The Trials of Matter and Stell, which was just published in the fall. That's the story of the 19th century, America's most famous, how does that, that subtitle go? The, oh, yeah. <laughs> America's most infamous female physician in the campaign to make abortion a crime. And this resonates, I think, all too well in these sometimes depressing and dangerous days in the post-Dobbs era, post-Dobbs decision. It also helps to explain, I think, the book's um, very enthusiastic and, I would say, enviable perception in the pages of the New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, and numerous other um, publications, public venues. But we don't have to read the reviews. We get to hear the story of Madame Rastel unplugged and in person. Um, and with that, Nick, on behalf of everyone, I would give you a warm welcome to the Department of History here at Queens and turn things over to you. Thank you. Um, 
thank you all so much for coming. This is a large, surprising to me, large audience uh, for a morning. Um, I'm delighted that you're all here. Um, thank you to Ashita uh, for inviting me. Thank you to Stephen for that lovely introduction. Um, I was just saying, I don't, I'm actually from Peterborough, Ontario, and so I have, um, even though I now live in the middle of the United States, I've been to Queens before, but I honestly don't think it was since I was about 18 or 19. I had friends who came here, um, and I think I came and visited during their first year of university. I might have even spent a night in a dorm. Uh, but I don't totally remember that time. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so I'm going to be talking today about the history of abortion, um, mostly in the 19th century United States. Um, and as you may or may not know, abortion was perfectly legal throughout the colonial period of American history, um, from the earliest period of English settlement along the East Coast until the 1820s, so about 200 years, give or take. The basic rule under English common law was, which was in use in the English-speaking colonies, including here in Canada, um, was that abortion was criminalized, but only as a misdemeanor and only if it occurred after quickening, so the moment that a woman feels fetal movement in the womb. Um, before that, it was not regulated at all. Uh, we know that native uh, people who lived here before European settlers, and of course continued to live here after they arrived, also regulated birth via abortion and various herbal uh, concoctions that were meant to terminate pregnancy or restore menstruation, and the line between the two is a bit of a gray area, um, called amenagogues, um, basically early modern forms of birth control. The same was true of enslaved people who were brought to uh, colonial America, eventually the United States, from Africa to work on southern plantations and in northern households. They too brought methods with them for terminating pregnancies. So abortion has actually been legal in the United States, especially if you, if you include the post row 1973 period, longer than it's been illegal. And today, as you likely know, and as Stephen alluded to, um, following the US Supreme Court's ruling in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization in 2022, it's either legal or various forms of illegal or regulated, depending on which of the 50 states you live in. Um, one of the sort of complications of researching U.S. history is this federalism that makes all 50 states so occasionally agree about things, but often not agree. Um, it was during the middle of the 19th century that abortion was criminalized in the United States, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I, I'll do so by focusing on the most famous abortion provider of that era. Her name was Madame Restell, um, though that was just an alias. Her real name was Anne Tro Summers Lohman, and she lived from 1811 to 1878. She was born in England, um, but she moved to the U.S. at age 20 and lived in New York City for the rest of her life. Uh, which is where she went into business. Uh, she sold contraception and amenagogues. She delivered babies in what was called a lying-in hospital that she operated out of her home, and she terminated pregnancies. It was the abortions that made her famous, though most people objected to all or, or some people objected to all or others, all of her other services at one time or another. And when I say famous, I really do mean famous. Uh, she advertised her products all along the East Coast and made headlines across the country the handful of times that she was put on trial. Newspaper men sold mass-produced transcriptions of her trials on the street corners in New York City. One of the ways that I was able to reproduce what happened in her trials was those transcripts. The word restellism became a synonym for terminating a pregnancy. She became quite wealthy as a result of her trade, and that made people all the more curious and often angry. The New York Police Gazette ran a story in 1856 reporting on their belief that Madame Restell and her husband did not have any friends. <laughs> she was so notorious that newspapers would report on the minutia of her daily life, not unlike the tabloids that tell us that stars, they're just like us, and then tell us about the minutia of their lives. Um, so in this particular case, and I'm quoting here, when they drive through Broadway, they are shunned by the crowd like a pair of lepers. They are as isolated in a city of three quarters of a million of inhabitants as they would be on the most desolate spot on God's earth, end quote. This story was reprinted as far away from New York as Wheeling, West Virginia, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a testament to Restell's national fame by the 1850s. Madame Restell was in many ways the face of abortion in the 19th century United States. So as Stephen said, I've written this book called The Trials of Madame Restell that tells both the story of her life and narrates how abortion came to be a crime in every single state by the early 20th century. 
The standard story of that latter process is that doctors in the American Medical Association banded together beginning in 1857 to influence state legislatures to criminalize it. They did so for many reasons, but chief among them was that they wanted to put their competition, people like Madame Rastel, who did not have medical degrees, out of business. They also objected to the married middle-class women who came to them demanding abortions and refused to accept their guidance when the medical men said no. The doctors saw such women as selfish and frivolous, having turned their backs on what was supposed to be their destiny, motherhood. There is lots of truth to this account, uh, and there's also no question that the rate at which various states passed laws that were more restrictive absolutely did increase from the 1850s onward once the AMA got to work influencing legislators. But many states had already begun this process by the 1820s, 30 years earlier than that American Medical Association campaign, including in New York State where Ristel practiced. There was also growing and widespread objection to the services provided by people like Madame Ristel from people other than doctors, so not just doctors objecting. And they objected not just to the fact that she terminated pregnancies, but also that she sold contraception, and, and this part is perhaps more surprising, that she delivered living, breathing infants as well. So the arguments made about female physicians' other services, including managing deliveries, often colored the way that abortion came to be understood as well. And that's what I'll be talking about today, is the sort of non-abortion related parts of this story. But first, um, let me tell you a little bit more about this woman, Madame Marcel, and then I'll come back and articulate the argument a little bit more clearly and give you some evidence about that. So Anne Tro, as she was first named, was born on May 5th, 1811, in the city of Painswick in the county of Gloucestershire in the western part of England, not far from its border with Wales. Anne was the daughter of John Tro and his wife, Anne Biddle Tro. She was baptized in the Church of England a month after her birth on June 9th, 1811. Her parents had been married for almost 10 years at the time of her birth, and her father is listed in various records as a laborer, likely in one of the local textile mills or perhaps in agriculture. Anne was her parents' fourth child after three brothers, and her mother, Anne Biddletrow, would give birth to five more children, four sons and a daughter following Anne. So if we're looking for inspiration about why Antro might have wanted to learn how to terminate a pregnancy, her own mother's experience of endless childbirth and motherhood is likely the place to start. Like many women of her era, the next time Antro appears in historical records is at the moment of her marriage. On March 26, 1829, she married 26-year-old Henry Summers in a nearby village called Wooten Bassett, which is a great name. Um, a little under 30 miles southeast of Painswick. Their daughter, Caroline Summers, was born there the following year and baptized on February 21st, 1830, and she would be their only child. The next step in their lives together was both the most consequential in one way and the one for which there is the least documentation. Um, they emigrated from England to the United States. Though we don't know precisely when, because the immigration records have been lost, if they really ever existed at the time, um, the immigration system was a lot more um, basic <laughs> in this era than it would become later. Um, so they'd arrived in New York by the late summer of 1831 when they first appear in records there, and soon thereafter, on August 1st of that year, Henry Summers died of a bilious fever, a catch-all term that referred to basically any fever that was supposed to originate in disorders of, related to bile. Um, Anne Summers was now the single mother of a daughter who was not yet two years old. She had one skill, sewing, and this is how she managed to support herself for the next two years during which she remained single. On September 30th, 1833, the New York Spectator printed a tiny little notice that Ann Summers had remarried. The groom, Charles Lohman, was born in St. Petersburg, Russia on August 8th, 1809. 19th century St. Petersburg was home to a large population of ethnic Germans at the time, as well as to 22 periodicals printed in German, which may be where Lohman learned his trade as a publisher. At the time of their marriage, he was 24 years old to Ann Summers, 22. And this portrait, 
um, is really the only one we have of Anne Lohman before she began to be depicted by the press as this figure, Madame Restelle. It's a miniature painting, it's quite tiny. Um, it's on a brooch um, that was almost certainly commissioned by her husband Charles to give to another relative in the mid to late 1830s when Anne herself was only in her mid to late 20s. So Anne Lohman first advertised as Madame Restelle in 1839, and this is an example from about a year later where she's selling preventive uh, powders. The evidence, and it's circumstantial, suggests that she learned her practice, the practice of midwifery from a male doctor named William Evans. She also began buying the medicine she would sell as contraceptive and abortifacient from a local druggist and then advertising it under her own name. Um, before any kind of government regulation, this was pretty common, there was no uh, Food and Drug Administration to regulate these things. Because she also advertised her services in aiding women in their confinements and in delivering their children, she was actually not doing anything all that new. Her work in medicine built on traditions dating back millennia. For most of human history, women assisted one another in birth. They were not formally schooled in medicine. Instead, they trained with older women who were already skilled midwives. Some midwives were also relied upon by their communities as healers who prescribed various combinations of herbal remedies for a wide variety of ailments. And these remedies included amenagogues that I mentioned before that were designed to restore menstruation, which could be blocked by a number of things, one of them obviously being pregnancy, um, but others of which could be stress, malnutrition, and other medical ailments. In the 1830s, when Lohman first trained in midwifery, the field of medicine was at something of a crossroads. In earlier eras, male doctors assumed medical legitimacy not via attending medical school, but by training alongside practicing doctors in ways that are pretty similar to what midwives did as well, just different kinds of medicine. The first medical school in the United States, the College of Philadelphia, was not founded until 1765. So by the early 19th century, however, increasing numbers of young men were formally training as doctors by attending medical colleges and earning degrees. Even the courses taught at those medical colleges, though, were relatively rudimentary, and doctors in training combined apprenticeship with two years of courses, and this part always amused me, the two years of courses, they were the same courses. The idea was just if you did it twice, it, the lessons would stick, because you learned it two times over. Um, for years, and despite the growing number of formally trained doctors, women's reproductive services continued to remain within the purview of midwives. And that began to change first in the UK and in France when male doctors developed the medical fields of obstetrics and gynecology and began to argue that male or what they called man midwifery was superior to the midwifery practiced by women. The male doctors relied on their formal scientific training to make this argument. At the same time, they also introduced a number of instruments into the birthing room, primarily the forceps, but also some others and some medications to justify both their presence, their prices, and their superior, the superior or supposedly superior level of their skill. And historians have actually demonstrated that infant mortality actually increased as a result of some of these innovations, which could result in injury and infection. So by 1839, that's the setup essentially, when Ann Lohman first went into business, the stage has been set in the United States for a showdown between these male, studied, learned, credentialed obstetricians and the midwives that they were slowly but surely replacing. Within a year of advertising her services, Madame Restelle began to refer to herself as a female physician. She did not have an MD. The first woman in the U.S. to receive formal medical training, uh, Elizabeth Blackwell, didn't earn her MD until 1849. In using this term physician, I'm arguing here that she was not actually attempting to deceive. She and other New Yorkers would have understood a physician to be a practitioner of medicine, distinct from a surgeon who was capable of operating on people, and was without question male. It also bears noting that no medical doctor was licensed at the time. With a handful of short-lived exceptions, states simply did not issue licenses until later in the 19th century. Thus, no unsuspecting patient would have believed that a female physician was formally trained in a medical school. For Restelle, I argue that the phrase meant that she was a woman who provided medical services to other women, medical services that were almost exclusively related to that which made women distinct from men, their capacity for pregnancy. And she was hardly the only woman to call herself a female physician, or even just a physician. 
Um, these are some examples here of really her competition. This is uh, Madame Costello, whose real name was Catherine Maxwell. This is Mrs. Bird, who we'll meet later. And this is this from a, a city directory here. This is Elizabeth Mott, um, who lived nearby and called herself a female physician as well. So it's relatively common as a term that people used. Um, there's no question that by the later 1840s, female physician became synonymous with abortion in the minds of many. But I'm arguing that that should not detract from what those who first used the phrase might have meant by it. In employing this language, Ristel and others like her were not simply describing their trade. Implicitly, they were also asserting their claim on this term at a moment when medicine was changing and women were losing ground in a domain that had largely been theirs for centuries. So in 1840s and 50s American cities, the so-called female physicians who terminated pregnancies, as I alluded to earlier, also delivered children in lying-in hospitals, which is a, sounds a little more uh, upscale than it actually is. Basically, we're talking about a room or two in a person's home during which a, in which a person could board and be delivered of their child. So hospital is a bit uh, overblown, perhaps. Um, some also advertised their ability to find new homes for those children during an era in which uh, abortion was not, or uh, adoption, sorry, was not yet legally regulated. Opposition to, de to the delivery of what were presumed to be bastard children was often just as vocal and sustained as that to the actual crime of abortion. Female physicians were often accused of abetting wealthier men who had seduced working class women on the one hand, or simply of helping to conceal illegitimate pregnancy on the other. In some instances, female physicians were even accused of delivering and then either kidnapping or murdering illegitimate children. Um, in looking at objections to female physicians that predate the organized doctor's campaign of the 1850s, I'm particularly interested in the services that female physicians offered that were not abortion, especially their work with single pregnant women and the ways that those services ended up influencing the debate about abortion. So that's what I'll talk about for the rest of this talk. Um, and here uh, you'll see an advertisement showing Ristel's services as a midwife who could deliver children. This one's a little bit fuzzy, but that's mostly what she's talking about in this ad. So let's look at the case of one of Madame Rastel's competitors first. Her name was Mrs. Bird, which was actually a pseudonym for Margaret Dawson, her legal name. She had been advertising her services as a female physician since the mid-1830s, so before Rastel goes into business. And in late March of 1841, a New York newspaper called The Log Cabin announced that Mrs. Bird was in custody, charged with, quote, being accessory by mismanagement to the death of one Maria E. Shaw, who died in her house after giving birth to a child. The Log Cabin noted Bird's reputation as one who afforded, quote, accommodations, concealment, and medical aid to women about to become mothers without being wives, which is a pretty good line. Um, in, case, in the case of 20-year-old Maria E. Shaw, quote, to avoid the, con the exposure consequent on being confined at home, she was taken by her mother to the house of Mrs. Bird about eight, eight weeks since to be boarded, taken care of, and confined. And confined is just the, the time before a woman is giving birth. One newspaper reported that she'd been seduced by a man named Rogers, but further details were not given. According to Byrd, and this is from the inquest, quote, the labor was not difficult or protracted. There was no instrument or other means used to facilitate. I never use instruments upon my own responsibility. Um, explaining why she believed her own actions, and I think importantly, the actions that an actual doctor might have taken, did not actually lead to Maria Shaw's death. Following the birth, Shaw was doing poorly, and Byrd called on a Dr. Wright, who administered stimulants. Nevertheless, Maria Shaw died about three and a half hours later. Maria's mother, to avoid, quote, the exposure of a public burial, conspired with Mrs. Byrd to have Maria's body secretly taken by a car man to the home of the undertaker, who had arranged to have Maria buried in the cemetery at the corner of East Broadway and Catherine Streets. The carman, however, grew suspicious about why the coroner was not involved, um, and as he normally would be, told his employer, who immediately summoned a police magistrate, and eventually the coroner, who ordered a post-mortem examination. After careful investigation, the jury at that inquest found that Maria Shaw had been, quote, in a very precar precarious state of health and much debilitated when she came to the house of Mrs. Bird. Therefore, while it was improper of Mrs. Bird to try to conceal the death, nevertheless, Maria Shaw died in childbed, and Mrs. Bird was released. 
The actions of Shaw and her mother demonstrate the real need that women like Mrs. Bird served in a city, a growing city like New York, where sex outside of marriage was increasingly common, but where the older remedies for pregnancy, that is pressuring the couple to get married, um, no longer worked. While we have no hard data, patients of female physicians were more likely to be single than married, if only because married women had other options for giving birth. Those with money could hire a midwife or doctor to attend them at home, as they've been doing for quite some time, or at least the midwife option. And those without could be accommodated at what was called the New York Asylum for Lying in Women, which only took married women. You had to prove marriage in order to be admitted there. Private lying in hospitals catered to single women, but ones who had enough money to be able to avoid the alms house or the poor house. Some of these women had their stay paid for by a lover or seducer, or in this case, a mother. The shame of an illegitimate pregnancy had brought Maria Shaw to Mrs. Bird, where she could spend the final weeks of her confinement away from the eyes of those who would see her growing belly. I'll talk about this cartoon in a second. Uh, Maria Shaw's death featured in a variety of newspapers, including this one, uh, Dixon's Polyanthus. Despite the fact that an inquest had found Mrs. Bird not guilty, newspaper man George Washington Dixon, writing in his paper The Polyanthus, claimed that Bird was entirely to blame. In the same uh, issue, Dixon printed a full page, three column wide anonymous letter that I think he just wrote himself, um, but did not admit to. Um, it was a letter of outrage over Bird's practices that also congratulated Dixon, the one who publishes the newspaper, for all the work he had done already to, quote, expose the character of Mrs. Bird, Madame Rostel, and others, and to bring public opinion upon their odious and wicked vocation. In this case, the delivery of a living child. Um, despite the fact that Maria Shaw had not terminated her pregnancy, Dixon also indicted Mrs. Bird as an abortionist. Quote, what is the service that Mrs. Bird engages to perform? Unequivocally, it is to practice abortion. For Dixon and others like him, both the termination and delivery of pregnancies were inextricably linked with illegitimacy in female physicians. And both of them were a problem, I'm arguing, not so much for the reasons that some today condemn abortion, that is, the termination of the existence of a fetus, but instead because they covered over the greater crime, illegitimate pregnancy. And I'll just show you, it's not great, but that's because it's from an old newspaper. Um, this is Rastel here, and there are little coffins all around the bottom of her skirt. That's Mrs. Bird, because she's got a bird beak. And this is also, that's where she lived, number 18 Oliver Street. Um, and then what you see here are fetus skeletons. And then that's death, obviously. Um, and this is a woman coming to Rastel, the abortionist, um, with a fetus in a jar. And all of these sort of refer to cases that were going on at the time. Um, and these, he was really fond of these, um, these cartoons. Each of them also has a little number, one, two, three, four, five, and there was an accompanying poem. And each number got its own stanza about how female physicians murdered infants and fetuses in a variety of different ways. So it was, it was inventive, um, <laughs> if misguided. Um, so in order to flesh out these arguments a bit more, I'm gonna focus on one particularly well-documented uh, incident surrounding Madame Rastel's practice, so we're switching between physicians. And unfortunately, we don't have any good illustration of this incident, but this is a newspaper uh, article that's covering it, and I'll summarize a little bit. So around noon on Monday, February 23rd, 1846, a crowd gathered on Greenwich Street in Lower Manhattan outside the home and office of Madame Rastel, who by that point had been in business for about seven years. Some reports estimated the size at more than 1,000 people. Others thought it was closer to 200 or 300. One noted that it was composed primarily of young men. Those assembled had been summoned by handbills posted around the city the night before. They were to hear a speaker on the subject of recent accusations that Madame Rastel had kidnapped an infant that had been born to a woman named Mary Applegate in her lying in hospital, and the fate of the infant was unknown, but some, had spe some speculated that Rastel had murdered the baby. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle reported that the crowd rent the air with curses and threats. Soon, some 40 to 50 police officers arrived and stationed themselves in front of Rastel's stoop. The crowd moved to a nearby location on Cortland Street where George Washington Dixon, the guy behind the newspapers, um, stood on a barrel and proceeded to arouse the crowd in its ire against Rastel. 
Um, he claimed that there were two demands the crowd had. Um, give back Mary Applegate's kidnapped or supposedly kidnapped child and leave New York immediately. While newspapers reassured readers that the gathering never became violent, this was still the largest gathering in opposition to Restell or any other female physician that had thus far occurred. It also bore some resemblance to the anti-abolitionist riots of the 1830s, where rioters attacked the homes of prominent abolitionists, accusing them of, in the words of the day, amalgamation or interracial sexual mixing. And to the brothel riots that had begun in the 1820s, and there were about 50 of them between 1825 and 1857, and then those riots, the brothel riots, groups of men broke into brothels and ransacked them, sometimes raping and injuring the sex workers who lived within. Historians have seen those riots as a means for mostly working class men to assert their masculinity and mastery over working women, who sometimes refused them service and often earned more than they did working in the sex trade. The brothel riots were, to be sure, more violent and usually more spontaneous than was this demonstration where they had the handbills up the night before. Um, but both were led by men and both drew on masculine anger about changing gender roles and the success of women entrepreneurs. Like this riot, the anti-abolitionist and the brothel riots were also clearly uh, sort of all about sexual politics. It's particularly significant that the incident that garnered the crowd was not actually related to an abortion. Instead, the outrage was about Restell's role in concealing illegitimate pregnancies and the supposed disposing of the infants that resulted from them. The outburst over Mary Applegate's child was just one moment among many when abortion, illegitimacy, and infanticide were linked. The consequence more broadly was to associate the practice of abortion with that of child abandonment and infanticide, all three depicted as the result of illegitimate pregnancy in a city whose morals and gender order had run amok. Applegate's story itself, that is, the, the woman whose child was supposedly taken, was relatively straightforward. She said she had been seduced by her employer's son, Augustus Edwards, in Philadelphia, where she worked as a domestic servant, uh, became pregnant, and at his urging and on his dime, come to New York to give birth to the child. She and Restell both seemed to agree that following the birth of the child, he had been sent to Harlem, uh, a neighborhood in up to, uh, uptown Manhattan, to a wet nurse. That is a woman who herself had recently given birth and, birth and would nurse the child for pay, which is a pretty common practice in antebellum America. It is unclear what Applegate thought would happen to him, the child was a boy, um, after that, however. Survival rates with wet nurses were notoriously low, though it's unlikely that Applegate necessarily knew that. At some point, Applegate left New York, then returned again for the child. Restell no longer had the child, and so Applegate lodged the complaints about kidnapping. The first inklings of Applegate's ordeal to appear in print largely focused on the missing child, many of the details of Applegate's story not known until she swore out a deposition two days later. On February 4th, 1846, the Herald, the Evening Post, and other papers reported on what one called awful disclosures involving a she-devil, the keeper of a stylish house for the slaughter of petite innocence located in the Third Ward. And they don't have Restelle's name quite yet, or they don't print it just yet. The Herald noted that, quote, a young man of respectable connections from Philadelphia had brought an 18-year-old girl whom he had seduced to New York, but that because she was too far along, she gave birth to a child in this house of horror and death. The Herald claimed that Applegate knew that her child had been taken to a wet nurse, but still, quote, the supposition is that the child has been murdered and thrown off the dock, or burnt, as it is the practice to do in many of these dens, end quote. It is highly unlikely that Restell did anything to harm the infant. Plenty of live babies left her lying in hospital in the arms of their mothers. She had no incentive, monetary or otherwise, to murder a living child. And I feel like I'm just sort of stating the painfully obvious here, but there we go. Um, she was paid for her services no matter what they were. While female physicians had been advertising those services in the penny press since the early 1830s and had never really hidden the fact that they also served as lying in hospitals, this incident alerted yet more New Yorkers that they were not just in the business of preventing and terminating pregnancies, they also delivered live infants, sometimes in secrecy, covering up illegitimacy in another way. <laughs> 
Because of poverty, new sexual mores, and a rapid increase in population growth, the numbers of abandoned infants really did actually increase in antebellum New York and other cities. Babies regularly washed up in the East and Hudson Rivers. Infant corpses were discovered in trash bins, in privies, and in sewers. Coroner's reports regularly document the death of these infants, some killed by strangulation or asphyxiation, um, others by marasmus, a catch-all term that technically refers to malnutrition and starvation, but that coroners sometimes applied when they just could not confirm what the cause of death was. And in some cases, they're not even really able to determine whether a baby was stillborn or had been murdered. Almost all public commentary on this epidemic explained it as the consequence of vice and illegitimacy. Single girls becoming pregnant, disguising their condition, then giving birth and dis disguising uh, the, or disposing, sorry, of the product of their licentiousness. It's almost certainly the case, however, that poor married women um, who made up, made up some of the mothers of these deceased infants, but they don't appear in the commentary about it. Regardless of what had actually happened in the case of Applegate, a number of newspapers pounced on the story as proof that Ristel was in the business of infanticide. Though, of course, in this particular instance, no body had yet been identified. Under the headline, another supposed, or chapter of supposed child murder on February 7th, the National Police Gazette, um, which loved printing about scandal and was no friend of Ristel, um, printed a specious story about Applegate arriving at Ristel's office, they said, for an abortion. Quote, but the instruments that failed to accomplish the hellish act and to avoid exposition of such a defeat of her infamous practices, the child was disposed of by Ristel's minions, end quote. Earlier in the story, the reporter had claimed that the child had born by mistake, we, we suppose. <laughs> With little understanding of how abortion actually worked, the Gazette seemed to imply that a pregnancy capable of being terminated could also result in the birth of a child able to live outside the womb. A stretch. Um, and actually contradicted the affidavit of Applegate herself, which they printed in full under the story. In essence, the Gazette was conflating a fetus and a child as they knowingly misrepresented what had happened in Ristel's office. The Gazette was sure, however, that what Ristel was doing, no matter what that actually might be, was linked to illegitimacy and needed to be stopped. The Gazette then urged readers to review the statement of this, quote, deceived, seduced, and frantic, beautiful girl. The way the story was framed, especially that last sentence, um, was a nod to the seduction narrative. First made famous with the publication of Susanna Rousen's 1791 novel, uh, best-selling novel, Charlotte Temple, wherein a virtuous girl is seduced by a lecherous man, usually under promise of marriage, abandoned, and subsequently falls into poverty, prostitution, perhaps worse. Although, for many of them, they could not imagine worse than prostitution. The seduction narr narrative could be used to indict the most obvious culprit, the seducer, but during the 1840s, it was also used constantly to indict female physicians like Ristel or Mrs. Bird or their contemporary Madame Costello, who supposedly aided the crime of seduction by covering its tracks. Never mind that women themselves also had a vested interest in keeping their indiscretion secret and sought out the services of female physicians. A number of days after Applegate gave her deposition, a reporter for the New York Medical and Surgical Reporter, a like a medical journal in New York State, called on the mayor for the purpose of collecting additional facts about the case. The report also included Applegate's description of the other patients at Ristel's, that is, the people she saw when she was there, most of whom stayed about four days and seemed to have been there to have their pregnancies terminated, not delivered, though the reporter was not always totally explicit on this point. The pattern that emerges is that of women attempting to conceal illegitimate pregnancies. One girl was from Philadelphia, and her stay was being financed, she said, by a congressman. Apple McGate met another young woman, 23 years of age, who supported her entire family posing as a milliner, a hat maker, um, but in point of fact was, quote, kept by a wealthy man of this city. She had supposedly had nine previous abortions, which, if true, inadvertently demonstrated Madame Rastel's skill. <laughs> Um, another girl came with her mother, who simply did not believe that her daughter could be pregnant. Upon Restel's confirmation that this was indeed the case, the mother demanded to know the identity of her daughter's seducer, to which the daughter replied that it was a close relative who stayed with them whenever he was in town. 
On being informed that Ristel could get rid of it for her daughter if she remained a few days, quote, the mother said that she would rather submit to anything else than this disgrace. While the report, which then got reprinted in the National Police Gazette, was clearly meant to titillate and shock readers, as well as to condemn those who sought out Ristel's services, it mostly served as a collective portrait in just total desperation. Um, the majority of the clients in the account were young, had been seduced or assaulted, or were in dire straits and needed to avoid pregnancy in order to continue to support themselves, and in the case of the milliner, their family as well. Even popular fiction of the period focused on the role of female physicians like Ristel and their supposed role in cases of infanticide. George Thompson, one of the more celebrated authors of sensational fiction in the antebellum era, included an instance of infanticide by physician in his 1849 City Crimes, or Life in New York and Boston. Uh, only crimes. <laughs> Uh, Miss Julia Fairfield, this is a fictional character, who lives in one of the noblest mansions on Broadway, is one month away from marrying her fiancé, Francis Sidney. The problem is that she has also been carrying on with Nero, a black servant in her home, and is pregnant with his child and due to deliver any day now. A few days after the reader meets her, Miss Julia is taken by Nero to a house of respectable exterior in Washington Street, where she is greeted by an elderly female. Fairfield remains there through the evening when the carriage returns for her. Quote, the next morning after her visit to the house on Washington Street, the newspapers contained a notice of the discovery of the body of a newborn mulatto child in the water off the Bowery Street in New York City. The child was the offspring of Miss Julia and the Black, his words. Um, it had been strangled and its body thrown in the water, end quote. Readers were led to believe that it was the female physician, not Fairfield, um, herself who had strangled and disposed of the body. The events on Greenwich Street, as well as the discourse about female physicians' supposed crimes, also point toward growing differences in how members of the working and middle classes understood illegitimacy and abortion, and indeed childhood itself. The working class men who seemed to have made up the majority of those who gathered that day mostly blamed upper and middle class men for seducing working class women, as well as Madame Restel for helping the men get away with it. While seduction could, of course, occur between two people of the same class, in popular culture it was often portrayed as a crime that, that a wealthy man perpetrated on a girl with few resources not just money, but also the social capital in the form of watchful parents that would allow her to understand that she was being used. When understood this way, it beca could become a rallying cry for working class men, like those who assembled on Greenwich Street to protect, quote unquote, their women from wealthier rigs and libertines. Middle class people were more apt to target working class culture writ large and what they saw as its easy acceptance of illegitimacy and lax morals. Middle class reformers, commentators, and lawmakers also targeted Ristel for her role in supposedly enabling this kind of licentiousness. Working and middle class people also differed in their interpretation of Ristel's alleged disposing of the child. To working class people, those who gathered on Portland Street, the issue was that Ristel was accused of stealing this one woman, Mary Applegate's child, whom they wanted to see returned perhaps doing so at the behest of her lover. Middle class reformers were particularly concerned about female physicians that they had no, they seemed, no regard for infant life of any kind, some believing that she regularly disposed of infants born on their premises. Even as working and middle class women quietly and steadily flocked to female physicians' doors, louder voices indicted their practices, but in ways that were different, differently inflected by social class. Um, it was, not shockingly, the middle class viewpoint that came to dominate discussions of infanticide and ab abandonment, and crucially link them with abortion. In 1845, just one year prior to the Mary Applegate incident, as the New York State Legislature was updating its abortion statute, and this is a part of that, uh, uh, they were updating their abortion statute, which increased the penalties and enlarged the scope of what and who could be prosecuted under its aegis, legislators added two other sections to the statute that are rarely mentioned by historians considering the criminalization of abortion, in part because they're not actually about abortion. 
but they were part of the very same law and they targeted mothers who concealed the birth of children. So the fourth section of this chapter 260, an act to punish the procurement of abortion and for other purposes, which was passed in May of 1845, made it a crime to conceal the birth of a bastard child, whether born dead or alive, punishable by up to a year in county jail. And section five, as you can see there, um, specified that anyone convicted twice would go to state prison for between two and five years. The statute dictates that even if a woman could prove that her child had been stillborn, for instance, if she were herself unmarried and concealed that child, she would be guilty of a misdemeanor. Trying to cover all bases at once, this statute could be used to punish a woman who was acquitted of the murder of her illegitimate child, for instance, if she could be found to have concealed the body of the child, no matter how the infant had died. So common did these legislators take the practice to be that they included the Section 5, which criminalizes doing it more than one time. Legislators were technically criminalizing the concealment of a body, no matter how it had come to die, but really they were penalizing illegitimacy because it only applied to the mothers of children born as bastards. And that's actually pretty typical of statutes that criminalized infanticide. They always assume that it is about illegitimacy. Um, but what was novel and possibly even unique about this statute was that legislators included these sections in a bill that criminalized abortion demonstrating that they saw abortion and infanticide as two sides of the same coin, both solutions to the problem of illegitimacy, which itself they very much wanted to discourage. The difficulty for those like Ristel and Byrd and Costello and others who practiced abortion was that the procedure came to seem as if it was similar to the practice of infanticide, which tainted the debate about abortion, indeed still does. Restel was regularly referred to as a child murderess and a professor of infanticide in the press. Abortion had plenty of foes on its own grounds. Obviously, it still does. Um, it gave women reproductive autonomy. Uh, some women were becoming wealthy as its practitioners. The middle class birth rate was declining as the immigrant birth rate remained high. But these were all straightforward, if misogynist and nativist, arguments against abortion. Likening the termination of a month's old pregnancy to the murder of a living child was a symbolic argument, but one that animated many antebellum newspaper men and lawmakers who encouraged to think of abortion as child murder because of both practices demonstrable links to the rise in illegitimacy during this era. Thinking about abortion as infanticide was a way to take it out of the, way, of the realm of women's health care, where it had lived for hundreds of years in the United States and its earlier colonies, and place it in the realm of criminal law. So why does all this matter? To me, it helps us understand that there was opposition to abortion that predated the American Medical Association's successful campaign to criminalize abortion throughout the nation. And that opposition focused on single women as much as it did those who were married, which most historians have focused on. It was also bound up not in abortion in and of itself, but instead focused on the reasons that single women sought it out, just as they did female physicians who could deliver and hide their illegitimate children. Lost, of course, was any consideration of the greater structural forces that had led to increases in illegitimacy in the first place, or men's dis demonstrable roles in pregnancy. Um, female physicians who catered to all of their clients' reproductive needs in what we might now call patient-centered medicine um, became scapegoated for their role in the concealment of illegitimacy, which ultimately contributed to the successful campaign to criminalize abortion altogether. The events involving Mary Applegate took place in 1846, and it would not be the last time that Ristel would be accused of kidnapping a living, breathing infant. The following year, she would be arrested for an abortion, and she was put on trial, her second major trial, and was convicted in 1847 and spent a year in the prison on Blackwell's Island, which is now Roosevelt Island, the island in the East River. This illustration here from the New York Police Gazette um, depicts Restel um, uh, with a devil emerging directly from her womb, which is feasting on, is it a baby, is it a fetus? It's sort of unclear. Um, but it does give you some idea of how she was depicted in the press um, and how abortion and infanticide had been conflated. Um, Herstel continued to practice into the late 1870s. 
And in the 1860s, she and her husband Charles built this sizable four-story mansion at the corner of 52nd and 5th Avenue, where she continued to see clients in the basement office. And if you ever go to New York City, this is where the Ferragamo um, flagship store is. I don't know if they know what preceded them there, um, but that's what's there now. Um, over the course of her career, abortion became more and more regulated to the point that by 1872 in New York State, any woman who terminated a pregnancy could herself be charged with a felony, as could anyone who helped her access abortion or procure any medicine or instrument that would assist her in so doing. In March of 1873, a man named Anthony Comstock succeeded in having Congress pass the lengthily titled, An Act for the Suppression of, Trade in, and Circulation of, Obscene Literature and Articles of Immoral Use, popularly known and more easily known as the Comstock Act, um, which effectively criminalized the selling or mailing of pornography, contraception, abortifacients, and any article used to terminate a pregnancy. He also helped to found the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice and struck a deal with the New York City cops that allowed him to stage raids on anyone he believed might be trading in such materials. And eventually, in 1878, it was Anthony Comstock, the man, who would visit Madame Rastel in her office on Fifth Avenue, and this would eventually lead to her undoing. So I want to close just by noting how so much some of the legislation um, that dates from the mid-19th century has, been, has sort of eerie similarities um, with what's going in, on in statutes in a variety of different states in the US right now, notably Alabama and Nebraska and Texas, but some others as well. Um, parts of the original Comstock Act, which most had thought was never again going to have bearing on the legal apparatus in the United States, are being invoked to order, in order to limit people's ability to receive abortion medications, mifepristone and misoprostol through the males. The Comstock Act was mostly about the male. Um, so truly, if there is one thing that I have learned in research and writing this book, it is just how little some things have changed, which is not a thing that historians like to admit most of the time, uh, looking for change over time. Um, while the legal landscape is in many ways quite different than what it was in the middle of the 19th century, the issues animating those who seek to eliminate, limit women's reproductive freedom are surprisingly and disturbingly similar. Thank you. Absolutely, if there are questions, I would be happy to talk. Questions, comments, or Yes. Uh, I just had a, a question on this intersection between this male medical profession and these female physicians. In the earlier, and the, this, the question of legitimacy, in the earlier period where there was less competition, where the midwives themselves and female physicians, were they also discriminating against illegitimate pregnancies? <clears throat> like, was there, is there any sense that maybe female physicians were like, cohort, like moved into this field because of competition with male physicians? Or is it just that the rise of illegitimate pregnancies and, and services? Great question. I think the answer is sort of, I mean, it's a little bit complicated. I think by and large in colonial America, there was more, when people became pregnant illegitimately, the first solution is get the couple to marry. Um, and there was a, a good deal of acceptance for that. And when they were married and then uh, a wife gave birth after the marriage, there was a great deal of acceptance. And within a few years, no one is really going to pay all that much attention to the fact that the child should have been born a little bit later than it actually was. It blended in fairly seamlessly. There was also a reasonable amount of understanding about why people might want to terminate an illegitimate pregnancy. That is, the real sin was not the termination, it was the sin that had come before. And most, I mean, it's hard to know the motivations, but I think there's, a, generally there was a supposition that most of the young women who become impregnated would willingly have married the men. It's the men who are not consenting to do so. So there's some sympathy both for the illegitimacy for her, even if also some condemnation, sex outside of marriage. Um, and also understanding for her if he refuses to marry and then he's going to be prosecuted for some sort of form of support as well. The real difficulty is that we have, at least for colonial what becomes the United States, so few records of abortions performed in 
in the sort of period before the 19th century. So there's one fairly uh, wonderful article by a historian named Nina Dayton that uh, documents a 1742 abortion in colonial Connecticut. And there, not only do they use words that make it clear everyone knows what this is, the slang is taking the trade, meaning to take an abortive patient, but almost everyone is fairly like supportive and understanding of the poor woman who had done so. And she actually does see a male doctor who attempts to terminate the pregnancy and she ends up dying, which is why we know about it at all. So I think the, what really accounts for it is the real rise in illegitimacy, or at least the rise in illegitimacy without the normal solution to illegitimacy at the same time that then these doctors are all having these fights with one another as well. Yeah? Hi, um, I'm Caitlin Burrow with the Burton Institute. Um, I thank you for a wonderful lecture. That was incredible. But my question is, you've mentioned a lot about the idea of like sin, and with that one comic that depicts the, the devil coming out of uh, the yes. Room. I was wondering how much we see um, spiritual care as a concern, um, especially considering midwives kind of had taken on a spiritual role and a little bit of a religious role prior to the nineteenth century. So do you see like religious communities coming in as a part of this, or is it mainly secular? That's a great question, and it's one I don't have a super good answer to. Most of what I found was secular concerns about this, but moral secular concerns. That is, abortion doesn't, this is not like a political issue in the way that we're thinking of it, where you could see right and left, like it doesn't enter into like electoral politics at all. But it is moral politics that I think you can absolutely find some religious roots to. But even the Catholic Church doesn't take a formal position, at least in the United States, in the way that they would later until much later in the 19th century. So I don't see, I, don't, I did not find a lot of discourse, say, by ministers weighing in about this. Certainly some did and sided with doctors. You do not find ministers weighing in on the sort of, I mean, almost no one weighs in on the side of the female physicians aside from them themselves, and they don't even speak out that much on their own behalf. Restelted, which is among the best sources for the book. Um, and I didn't see a lot of commentary about midwives' spiritual roles, which is absolutely there. We know that in earlier eras particularly. I think part of what might be happening, but again, I'm sort of thinking out loud because I hadn't thought about it much before, is that because they've become so commercialized at this point, they're perhaps seen as not being spiritual in the way that they might have been in other eras where they're seen more as like community healers and they're a part of the community. The commercialization partially gets them separated from and obviously they're in neighborhoods, they know people, but because people are coming to them from all over the place, they're not lodged in a community in the same way that they would have been, say, in a village or just a very small town or something like okay, that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, though. It's not one I've given a lot of thought to, but um, it's something to think about. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm Tony Delia. I teach uh, Italian Renaissance history, so very different. But uh, I was, I was uh, wondering about how common wet nursing was in 19th century New York and, and uh, what, what its connection with race and class uh, might have been. Yeah, wet nursing was pretty common, but it happened in two, I mean, to be blunt about it, two different ways. So rich women could pay newly, women who had recently given birth to come and live in their homes as private wet nurses to uh, lactate their own children. But of course, then if this woman has recently given birth, either that child has died or that child has to go somewhere else. So then what we know is that there are poor women who have taken in children, and that's mostly who Ristel is dealing with. Poor women who have given birth recently, some of them take in multiple children themselves. The Alms House also basically farmed out babies to poor women who uh, wet nursed multiple children within their homes as well. Eventually what happens a little bit after this period in the later 19th century is the development, first in England and Scotland and then later in the US, of this term called baby farming. Um, which is fascinating, um, but it was essentially like a more commercialized form of wet nursing where women would take in more children really than they could have handled to nurse and they're using not um, uh, breast milk, um, but some kind of, kind of commercial formula which was not good or effective and the argument that really sort of comes into play around wet nursing is that the supposition is that many people who live there, leave their children with wet nurses 
know that they will die and are essentially doing this. They're not gonna murder their children, but they're unable to take care of them. They leave them there. They go off with the supposition that the wet nurse might find a new home for them. But everyone knows that the payment that they give is going to be of more use to the wet nurse who's taken them or the baby farmer who's taken them in. Um, if she pockets the money than if she actually uses it to care for the children. So there was a pretty big debate about it. Um, and some of the institutions that um, that cropped up, one, I think a, like a very typical middle-class white women's sort of solution to this is, and I'm gonna not forget the name of it, but it was some combination of New York and lying in an asylum, but in different order, was their solution was essentially like, we know this is a problem for women who are poor, so let's set up a situation where women can come, give birth, and then one or two of them, or some portion, will stay behind and wet nurse everyone's children, and will send all the other ones out to be servants in other people's homes, and their wages will support, you can see the white middle class women thinking this is gonna like solve it all. Um, so it, there were constant debates about it, um, and some people had, really benefited through what nursing existed and others clearly were exploited through it. Um, thank you, Rebecca Manley, in the department. I was really struck when you uh, first sort of introduced um, her, you talked about the potential inspiration to go into this sort of yeah. plan for her and her mother and some of the children. But of course, and, and the advertisements, which presumably are also geared to sort of, you know, uh, bolster their respectability, yeah. uh, but that are clearly targeting married women, yeah. right, for, um, uh, who, who want to slow down the pace yes. of, of childbearing. Um, and yet the reality that most, of, it seemed like a good part of her business, uh, if not the majority of the business is coming from single women, uh, non-married women. And I just, so I guess the question, Two questions. One is, uh, do you have material on the way or, or insight into the way that she conceptualized yeah. the work she was doing and the kind of mission? Was this, you know, what was the vision of yeah. writing it? And um, and what did you learn also about the business side? Where sure. Did she make money? Yeah, those are great questions. And um, so. The unfortunate or more challenging thing that all historians will sympathize with about this is she left nothing behind. There are no papers. Um, or if she did, the people who inherited them did not preserve them anyway. So we don't really know what she thought, with the exception, and it's a big exception, and it's kind of the best part about her, is that she both wrote fairly lengthy advertisements, which I didn't put up here because it wasn't the main focus, but the advertisements, she often would do two ads on the same page, one of which is more straightforward about this is what I offer, this is how much it costs, this is where you get it. The other is framed literally as a letter to married women. And it is as close to feminist as I think we're gonna find without the word, in which she says, I know why you might want to limit your birth. You want to look after the children that you already have. Also, we know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, we know that childbirth is dangerous. She throws in a nod to the husbands who don't want their wives to die and want to be able to provide for their children. It is a thorough accounting of why what she is doing is in the service of women and why women should want this, can want this, deserve this. Um, she also regularly wrote letters into the newspaper at a time when that was not particularly common, really, for anyone but certainly for women. Um, I think, I don't know, I think she might have paid to have them printed, but at times when her name was in the news, I think the newspapers also knew, like, this is gonna sell if we print it. And they were these long justifications that had to skirt around like she could never say like, yes, obviously I terminated that pregnancy, that would be, but she comes very close at times. And it's always a, a sort of woman-centered justification for the work that she's doing. So, I make a fair bit of that because I think it's important. And she alone did that. Costello and Bird clearly didn't have quite the budget that she had. Um, one historian has calculated what she must have spent on advertising, and it is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, like her dollars, um, which is obviously a lot more today. Um, so that's the like motivation question. Um, I think there actually were probably fair numbers of middle class women, especially once she gets to that house. Like, I don't think she's delivering babies by that point. She's mostly just selling things. And her, there's lots of evidence in the beginning she operated on a sliding scale. She took like 
payment plans. She had people come who could afford nothing. They would stay as a servant in her house for two weeks and clean, be delivered of a child or have the child the pregnancy terminated. And that was the payment, which newspapers made all like, like that this was very mercenary of her. I see it more as sliding scale for allowing multiple customers who have needs. So I think she really did see it that way. Um, but we don't really know the breakdown. I think we, we know among other things that if in the United States among middle class women, the birth rate is effectively halved over the course of the 19th century. And that's without not great without great contraception being available. So there's obviously some planning, some abstinence, some contraception, but also some abortion that is accounting for that. And so I think I mostly focused on the single woman, but I think there are a lot of married women as well. And there are reports certainly like when she's arrested, there are married women with her there. She talks about married women as well. So. Yeah, but it's the it's her self presentation that make her to my mind like I mean this is a lot of fascinating regardless but make her also a really sympathetic character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really fascinating. Certainly, we know like more side of the history of obstetrics and men midwifery that yeah. infant mortality and maternal mortality rates actually rise yeah. when women start giving birth in hospitals and men get yeah. involved in the process like yeah. they did. Like forceps, challenge, and, yeah, yeah, fever, yeah. all those kinds of things happen. Um, was anybody making those arguments in support of female physicians at the time? Did you see that at all? No, they make lots of. Uh, so most of the time, when something, when. Uh, termination made the news, it was often because someone had died. So obviously something has gone very wrong in the first place. Or the two times that she goes on trial, someone has not died, but there's some sort of blackmail extortion sort of going on by the women or one of the woman's husbands. So she never lost a patient, um, but others certainly did. And so generally there was indictment in public places at least that like these people are not trained and so they don't know what they're doing and so forth. Um, it was so rare to find any defense of her or her colleagues on any grounds, really. She did, a few others did, um, but to defend them was really to defend the practice of abortion generally. And even 19th century feminists occasionally would acknowledge that abortion was necessary, but only because they were saying that men's behavior is what's forced women into pregnancies they don't want to have. There was never like the full-throated defense that we see now about autonomy and those sorts of things. Um, so I didn't find any defense at all. I, in some ways, it's almost a miracle that we can't, or I can't find any evidence of anyone dying under her care, only because we know that a lot of the time it wasn't medical ineptitude, it was infection. It was lack of sanitation. It was all kinds of things that they didn't really understand that could happen in any medical procedure. So it is, sort of shocking that it did not happen to her, or if it did, she was very good at concealing it, which is totally possible. Yeah? Um, you sort of answered this by saying how much she spent on advertising, but looking at the mansion that she built with her husband, I wondered how profitable her business was and how profitable her type of business tended to be. Yeah, so she was the most profitable of all of her colleagues, though some of them, Costello stays in business. She's the one I talked about the least. She's a fascinating character. She publishes a book in 1860, Costello, a, like a married woman sort of companion walking through all of the things married women need to know. Um, we're still easily the most profitable. She left behind an estate in the millions of dollars to her grandchildren, including that house. Her husband predeceased her. The other thing to know, though, is that her husband was in the business, too. So he operated under seven or eight different pseudonyms, the most popular of which was Dr. A.M. Morisseau, which all many of them harken back to French gynecologists that really did exist, but with like one or two letters changed. Um, and he did not, so far as I can tell, um, terminate pregnancies manually, but he sold all the same medications that she did. He also sold a bunch of quack medicines. He sold what he said was a super quick, easy fix to infertility. We don't yet have that one. Um, so I'm assuming it was not effective. Um, so they really worked in tandem. Um, 
I don't know, like on an annual basis, what her profits were. They clearly were sizable because when she starts out, she starts in a, you know, relative, I've gone and visited most of the places where she lived, some of which exist, some of which don't. Um, but a, like a relatively modest place downtown, she moves uptown once and then she, they build that enormous place. So she is anomalous, she's an outlier, but it certainly was profitable enough to sustain a career because some of her competitors did as well. Um, thanks so much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I guess I'm wondering, I have a lot of thoughts in my head, but I'm wondering right now about um, the use of images in the anti-abortion campaign or anti-infanticide, anti-women in medicine. Yeah. Going on that campaign. Um, because, you know, I think when we get a modern day anti-abortion people, we saw them associated with like people who are on the sidewalk and have those generous yes. and that are like, not necessarily accurate to, to what is, that abortion is actually like because they depict you like a fully formed yeah. baby. Yeah. It's just so I don't know. I was wondering if you could speak about the the role that imagery plays in this thing to continuity from yeah. this time to the modern day. Because another thing that I was thinking is like it's interesting that Estelle is such a uh, prominent figure in that one picture. Like the you can see the baby being eaten by the devil, but she's much bigger yes. of a figure, and so the emphasis visually seems to be like on a different. Like, I don't know, a different part of the crime, or, or yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's a thing I thought about a lot, and when I first started thinking about this book, one of the things I was really interested in, because I had seen accounts where one were, initially I thought the accusations of kidnapping were just totally false, but there were actual children involved. I don't think she did it, but but I was really interested in like the discourse of the fetus or the baby and, and also how it was depicted. And so there's, there's a great book um, by a historian named Sarah Dubow called Our Cells Unborn, A History of the Fetus in the Modern United States, which is really about like, how does the fetus come to dominate the abortion debate? And she really dates it from the later 19th century. But what I could find was clearly like there are fetuses everywhere in some of this stuff, or infants or babies or whatever, or like little like fetus skeletons, and that's not the only one. There are multiple of these in other cartoons as well. So part of the argument I was making is that is that the fetus and representations of it as looking like babies or skeletal babies does play a role earlier than what historians have tended to see. That, it, that the discourse about even just using the word infanticide for not infanticide um, and its visual representation is more important maybe 30, 40 years earlier than what we've tended to see. And I think in some ways it's un like it's uncomfortable for historians who are also pro-choice and really care about the abortion debate, I'm among them, um, because we're used to the notion that the fetus only really comes to matter much more recently. And it is more complicated than this era, but I've got evidence of doctors in the 1830s absolutely just saying life begins at conception, you're wrong, everyone who says otherwise, this is, that's why this is infanticide. And so I think it all does happen, like we need to push it back, the, the acknowledgement of the fetus more than we have. Um, I'm not, I'll be the first to admit, like a sophisticated reader of images as a historian. People do it much better than I do, but I found multiple of them. You can't quite see it here, but like they're little fetuses in each of these coffins as well. Um, and I think that sometimes the people who were including these images, like I don't think that it was necessarily their they had thought it through enough to say, here's a strategy for the way that we can, um, you know, stigmatize this process. But the, the go-to way for them to do it was to show these fetuses as babies. Um, and there's plentiful evidence for that. So I think even if in an unconscious way, they adapted the visual for people in these newspapers that were, you know, sold all over the place. Yeah. Me. I just have a very quick question about um, whether or not um, ideas about sex work or madams ever figured into these discussions, only because I, I sort of see a few parallels between um, people defending sex work as protecting from other women getting seduced or yeah. protecting against illegitimacy um, or indicting madams or females in positions who become wealthy versus while not inviting the male clients or male seducers. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm curious. 
Yes, so I think I haven't seen it Again, it's hard to find the defense, so that example I have not found, but certainly the indictments, I think that the, even just that she is, she chooses Medea, and they all, many of them chose these, not just pseudonyms, but sort of like vaguely European sounding because it was like adjacent to the sex trade. And there is lots of discourse about how she is also implicated in prostitution and sex work because she is believed to be terminating pregnancies or delivering the children of people working in sex work as a trade. So she gets bound up in that a fair bit as well. Um, and I think, what reminded me of it the most, and there's some discourse about this, particularly in like the in New York City in the 1830s and 40s, there uh, I don't know what it was called this at the time, but historians have referred to it as the flash press. Um, these cheap uh, newspapers, this was one of them, the polyanthus, but there are a whole lot of them, and they're really a press that was made by like men about town for other men about town. It would tell you where brothels were. But it, and it would also, all these salacious stories about abortionists and madams and prostitutes and so forth, um, that was sort of walked a line between seeming to indict these practices, but at the same time, it's just telling everyone all about them. But she gets talked about in the same way that brothel madams get talked about as well. And so I think it's both that they're seen as exploiting other sexual problems in order to make a profit, and there's a lot of focus on wealth, um, and that they're not supposed to be doing it. In her case, she's got a husband, but he's sort of like not known. And I think in the case of madams who were pres some had husbands, but the husbands get erased a lot of the time because they're seen as like, what is this upsetting of the gendered order that they're earning all the money? So similar discourse for sure. Yeah? You just made a reference to this sort of yin and yang of moral panic and uh, prurient interest. Yeah. Um, is all of that. Is this is going on? All the time in the, in the pressure of your, 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 your... Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, there were differences. There were some newspapers who took the moral... I mean, I would, wouldn't agree with them, but they said they took the moral high road and they would not print her advertisements. So then some newspaper, like that newspaper, then can criticize the newspapers who are the most hypocritical and obvious about this. Like, outrage, outrage, turn the last page and see the advertisements. Or the outrage is also with extensive detail about everything that's going on. The National Police Gazette or this one are the most obvious about that. But yeah, I see a lot of that happening. And then the, the most obvious contradiction too is that there's no way that she could become wealthy without an enormous clientele of people who are going there, none of whom feel like they can really say anything in her defense. Um, so that sort of operates at the level of like action versus word, whereas what you're pointing to, I think, is word versus word. And it, yeah, absolutely, it's constant moral outrage and shock, some of which I think legitimate, especially in the papers that don't then take her money, but others of which the, the, it's just selling papers. Or in the case of a flash press like this, that is both morally outraged and then really spreading as much as possible access to sex work and people like Ristel who will help. And I think you can see uh, this guy, George Washington Dixon, he really leads some of the campaign against her. And I don't think, like morally, I don't think he cared about abortion or prostitution because he's writing about them constantly and he's letting men know about them. But I do think that he finds her deeply offensive on gender grounds, like who is she to profit this way? Who is she to speak on her behalf? All of that, I think, legitimate outrage, even if what it is that she's doing or enabling, he was more comfortable with. 